Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everybody, or good evening for those uh, joining us across the Pacific. Thank you very much for uh, logging in for this first part in our two-part uh, conference on the future of the U.S.-Vietnam partnership. So today we're going to focus mostly on the economic relationship between uh, U.S. and Vietnam. And for those able to join us in two days on April 29th, we will discuss political security matters, mostly. Everything said today is going to be on the record. And for those unable to watch the video now or who have to hop off, we will, of course, post it to YouTube as we do all of our, our content. Uh, this event is made possible by generous support from Samsung, and it's actually the closing event in a year-long series uh, that we have engaged with Samsung on, uh, for which we are extremely grateful. Today, as with most of our Zoom webinars, we're going to use the Q&A function only because it is uh, a little too many people logging on to give everybody the chance to ask their questions on camera. So if you do have questions, uh, either for uh, the ambassador in the opening keynote or when we get to the panel discussion later, please type them into the Q&A section, uh, and I will read them to the panelists. I would ask that you please uh, identify yourself when you ask a question, uh, only so that our speakers know to whom they are responding. And so with that, let me introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Ambassador Ha Kim Yok, who is the ambassador of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam to the United States, a good friend of CSIS, a good friend to the US, uh, he's going to give us uh, opening remarks, and then we'll move into a brief Q&A before we head at uh, 9.30 here in the U.S. to our panel discussion. So with that, Ambassador Young, let me step aside and turn the floor over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, Mr. Grigory Pauling, the Senior Director for Southeast Asia and Director of the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative, Ambassador Ted Osas, Vice President for Government Affairs and Public Policy of Global Asia Pacific, Ms. Mary Tanoka, Executive Director of AmCham Vietnam, Professor Nguyen Tang of Fulbright University Vietnam, ladies and gentlemen. I would first like to thank Mr. Gregory Pauling and CSIS for inviting me to this webinar. It is a pleasure for me to see some of my friends and partners here today. Ambassador Ted Osas, former Consul General Mary Tanoka, Director Edgar Kagan, and many others. You are all great friends of Vietnam and key contributors to the ever deepening ties between our countries. I would also like to thank um, CSIS for your dedication to promoting academic exchange and mutual understanding between Vietnam and the United States, especially on regional security challenges. CSIS is highly regarded among Vietnamese scholars and policymakers. It is not a coincidence that many of our top leaders have visited and spoken at CSIS over the past years. Let us hope the COVID-19 situation improves enough so that we may witness one such visit by the end of this year. Ladies and gentlemen, as we stand at the threshold of major changes to the global landscape, I wish to make three predictions for the future of US-Vietnam relations. First, our partnership will follow a stable upward trajectory defined by growing common interest and mutual beneficial cooperation. What underlies this thriving partnership is a solid foundation of 25 years of diplomatic ties. Over these 25 years, across various US administrations, Vietnam and the United States have developed mechanisms for lasting cooperation and have celebrated great achievements. We have exchanged frequent state level visits. 
our bilateral trade has enjoyed a 200-fold growth since 1994. We have made important strides in enhancing defense and security ties, especially in addressing war legacy issues and maritime capacity building. <clears throat> Our people-to-people -people ties have deepened at a pace that defies expectations. In 2019, before the COVID outbreak, over 800,000 American tourists visited Vietnam. Over 32,000 Vietnamese students are studying in the United States and many Vietnamese localities have formed partnerships with American states and cities. Our two countries have expanded beyond the bilateral agenda to work closely together on regional and global challenges, including the South China Sea or East Sea issue, the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, sustainable development in the Mekong subregion, COVID-19 and post-pandemic economic recovery, climate change, non-proliferation issues, and UN, UN peacekeeping operations. We have had areas of differences, but we have also put in place channels and mechanisms to manage these differences and to forge common ground. We have affirmed our respect for each other's sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political systems. <clears throat> The United States has expressed its support for a strong, prosperous, and independent Vietnam capable of charting its own independent foreign policy course. Our two countries have fostered mutual trust and have grown to understand each other's hopes and concerns, strengths, and limitations. The past few years, are proof that the foundation of our relationship is stable and strong. Despite the differences in policy views between the Obama and Trump administrations, we saw a clear continuation in US policy towards Vietnam. And today, the Biden administration looks ready to carry on and to build on this policy for the years to come. My second prediction is that the upcoming decade will witness a more pronounced convergence of Vietnam-US strategic interests. The United States will remain a major power in the Asia Pacific and will continue to play a decisive role in shaping the region and beyond. As a fellow Asia Pacific nation, Vietnam shares with the United States a strong desire to maintain regional peace, security, stability, and cooperation, to uphold the international rule of law, and to preserve the freedom of navigation and overflight. <clears throat> Our two countries have been steadfast partners in these efforts for many years, and recent developments may allow us to collaborate even more effectively in the years ahead. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> One important development is the Biden administration's recommitment to strengthening network of global alliances and partnerships and to supporting ASEAN centrality in Asia's regional architecture. Having an ASEAN that is strong, united, resilient, and in good relations with all its dialogue partners is in the strategic interest of the United States. Vietnam and other ASEAN member states are hopeful that the United States will soon appoint a resident ambassador to ASEAN to enhance the US-ASEAN strategic partnership we welcome President Biden to attend the East Asia Summit at the end of this year. 
we further hope that the United States will recommit to regional economic integration, including through joining the CPTPP. We are ready to work with the United States to enhance regional economic cooperation, trade and investment, and to ensure a sustainable supply chain in the Asia Pacific for the shared prosperity of all countries. In the Mekong subregion, Vietnam and other countries will continue to cooperate with the United States and other relevant partners to ensure security, inclusive development, and environment protection for riparian countries. In the maritime domain, Vietnam and ASEAN welcome the United States' continued commitment to upholding such cardinal principles as the freedom of navigation and overfly and the peaceful resolution of disputes in accordance with international law, including UNCLOS 1982, especially with the recent concerning developments at Whitson Reef, a feature well within the territorial waters of Vietnam's Grierson Reef in the Spratlys. Vietnam is in a stronger position than ever to help shape the rules-based order thanks to its steady economic development and growing reputation as a regional stakeholder. Uh, Vietnam has been taking on critical roles in ASEAN and ASEAN-centric mechanisms in recent years. As chair of ASEAN in 2020, Vietnam facilitated U.S. cooperation in the Mekong subregion and U.S. engagement with ASEAN on combating the COVID-19 pandemic and economic recovery. On the global stage, Vietnam has worked closely with the United States as a fellow member of the United Nations Security Council. As the balance of power in the Asia Pacific continues to tilt towards the East, the United States will need greater regional support to uphold peace, security, stability, and the international rule of law. but also offer advice and even take the lead where the United States cannot afford to. And I'm hopeful that Vietnam will step up to become one such partner to the United States. Third, and finally, no great power competition in the Asia Pacific may become fiercer in the coming years there will still be space for smaller countries like Vietnam and other ASEAN countries to stay on an independent foreign policy course and to continue cooperating with all major powers. This is because even these big players will seek cooperation, especially on addressing challenges that transcend any bilateral relationship such as climate change, nuclear proliferation, and global pandemics. The Leaders' Summit on Climate, which took place just last week, is a vivid example of this trend. Ladies and gentlemen, the year 2021 has brought with it great political changes for our two countries. The United States has a new president, a new administration, and Vietnam has recently welcomed new figures to our top leadership. But despite these transitions, the trajectory for Vietnam-US relations remain firm. Vietnam's 13th National Party Congress reaffirmed Vietnam's consistent foreign policy and our determination to deepen the comprehensive partnership with the United States. On the US side, the interim national security strategic guidance placed Vietnam 
among prioritized partners in the Indo-Asia-Pacific region, together with India, New Zealand, and Singapore. We look forward to welcoming President Biden in Vietnam. We appreciate the President's nominating Deputy Assistant State Secretary Mark Knepper as the new ambassador in Hanoi. His predecessor, Daniel Kutumbring, has been a brilliant ambassador and has become famous in Vietnam following the release of his rap video on the occasion of the Lunar New Year. Distinguished participants, if his story is any indication, whenever Vietnam and the United States enjoy good relations, the peace, security, and prosperity of our region are better and sure. With 25 years of cooperation and trust as our bedrock, the lessons learned from our shared history as our compass and with burgeoning shared interest as our drive, we may press forward to ever greater heights in our partnership. Thank you for your attention. And I would like to thank Samsung for facilitating this event. Thank you, Ambassador Nyok. Uh, I, I appreciate it. You were having a bit of, of audio distortion on your end, but I think we, we could hear it okay. And now I am too, because my neighbor just started mowing their lawn. So I apologize to everybody on for the various Zoom difficulties that we all have to live with at the moment. Uh, I would invite uh, the audience to submit any questions they have through the Q&A function. We still have about 13 minutes uh, with the ambassador to ask some questions. Um, while that fills in, I would like to ask one question that um, I know was on a lot of minds, obviously, for the last four years. And that is the problem, uh, well, as the last US administration saw it anyway, the problem of the growing US-Vietnam trade deficit, which last year cracked, uh, I think, $69 billion. I'm wondering what, from your perspective, what is it that, that Hanoi thinks can be done, should be done to balance trade? Or do you think this is really no longer a problem um, anymore as of three months ago? Thank you, sir. <laughs> this is a very interesting question. Um, I think um, this is a reality and the two sides have been working very closely um, to deal with it. Uh, on our side, we have been buying more American goods. We open our market for US products and we see the service and also the ag agriculture export from the United States to Vietnam increase sharply. And at the same time, uh, we also uh, encourage Vietnamese businesses to invest in the United States. You know, the Anfat holding uh, has spent about 200 million US dollars to build their factories in the United States and creating hundreds of jobs. And they hope to expand their activities here. Um, and, uh, you know, Vin Group is going to invest also hundreds of millions of US dollars uh, to make electric cars in the United States. So I think this two way um, cooperation will help. Uh, to benefit both sides. And I, I don't think that we can solve the problem overnight uh, with the uh, COVID-19. And I think the increased demand uh, from the US of the goods from uh, Southeast Asia and especially Vietnam, we will see even the increase in our bilateral trade. But I would like to emphasize the spirit here is the cooperation between our two sides. To, and try to balance that trade volume, but it takes time. Thank you, Ambassador. Let's turn to the audience Q&A. Um, so the first question I got was from uh, Vu Ha Chao with Radio Free Asia, who asked a series of questions, and I apologize to Ha Chao, I'm only gonna ask one um, to, for in, in fairness to the fact that we only have 10 minutes. So his first question was, uh, in the past 26 years, we've seen remarkable developments in the US-Vietnam relationship. Do you think people-to-people -people ties between the two countries have followed that same trajectory? 
Uh, and do you see those ties as having promoted the overall relationship? Yeah, um, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I am so touched when, when I arrived here as ambassador of Vietnam, the sixth ambassador of Vietnam to the US, I witnessed very high interest of the US uh, public from uh, the administration, the Congress, the business communities, NGOs, um, to the ordinary people. Everywhere I go, people talk about Vietnam, US-Vietnam cooperation. And uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, in 2019 only, we have over 800,000 American tourists visited Vietnam. And by the end of that year, we targeted 1 million American tourists to visit Vietnam, but the COVID-19 killed our plan. On the other side, I think hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese went to visit the United States. And we also have a large Vietnamese community of 2,000, uh, 2,400,000 Vietnamese living in America. So I think the transaction, the connection between the two sides really helped to increase the mutual understanding and mutual trust, which is the very strong foundation for our cooperation in the next 25 years or even 100 years. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Stuart Shag, who said the flip side of trade is investment and the US continues to lag behind other partners like South Korea and Japan on FDI into Vietnam. What is your forecast for US FDI to Vietnam? What sectors do you think are most attractive to US businesses? And I'll say, I'm sure we'll hear more about this on the panel as well. Thank you. Uh, this is also a good question. I think um, <clears throat> uh, Ambassador Ted Osses and Consul General Tanoka can give you a more uh, uh, elaboration on this issue. But I think um, in recent years, we have seen a tendency that many American companies, they um, part, move part of their investment from China to Southeast Asian country. And Vietnam is one of their favorite destination. And with the uh, pandemic, uh, I think also the adjustment of supply chain, we have seen more and more American companies uh, moving to Vietnam and Indonesia, Thailand, and, and some other Southeast Asian countries. So I think uh, we will see a sharp increase of uh, investment uh, from the United States to Vietnam in the coming years. And uh, of course, Vietnam, we uh, now have 100 million uh, consumers. It's a large market. And the middle class is growing very fast. And the most important thing is Vietnam, we have FTAs with major, all major uh, economic powers in the world. Um, the CPTPP, RCEP, EVFTA. So this is the advantage for American companies who invest in Vietnam, because when they export their products to uh, our partners, they will enjoy the advantages. And also the, uh, the working force in Vietnam, very young, uh, talented, educated. So the government also have the incentives, you know, for um, American investors, especially in the areas of infrastructure, high tech, renewable energy. So I'm very optimistic uh, about the uh, uh, investment from US companies in Vietnam in the years to come. Thank you, Ambassador Nyok. So speaking of renewable energy, um, we have a couple of questions on, on energy and I'll try to bundle them. So first we had Suzanne Logan in the Q&A who asked uh, what you think goals are in respect to the US Vietnam power uh, and energy cooperation, particularly Vietnam's goals in the Tower Development Plan. And we also had Ted Osius, who will join us on the panel, ask uh, whether or not Vietnam will purchase liquefied natural gas from the US as a bridge toward uh, greater renewable energy sourcing in its energy mix, and would there be strategic and environmental benefits of doing so? Mm -hmm. um, I think um, <clears throat> for the uh, uh, upcoming years, 
we will reduce the use of coal. But we need a roadmap, yeah, you know, um, and uh, during the uh, leaders summit on climate, our uh, new president, Nguyen Xuân Phúc, he already made the commitment, you know, to uh, uh, world leaders that Vietnam will have a plan to reduce the use of coal. And we, we will use more renewable energy like solar wind uh, energy. Uh, but of course, uh, we need a transitional, transitional period. For uh, LNG, I think it is very important for Vietnam um, in the coming years. And uh, in the US-Vietnam uh, bilateral cooperation, we signed the MOU on the energy security, which put more emphasis on renewable energy, LNG. And I myself uh, visited Alaska and also the LNG facilities over there. And you may have heard that American companies like EAS, they are building facilities in the center part of Vietnam so that we can import LNG from the United States. And that will also help to improve the bilateral trade between our two countries. Thank you, Ambassador. We're not going to get through all of the questions in the queue. I can already see that. We only have probably time for one more. So let me uh, give that to Bic Tron with the University of Antwerp, um, who will be speaking in two days at our, our second event. She asked whether or not there are any solid plans to upgrade the US-Vietnam comprehensive partnership to a strategic partnership in the near future. <laughs> this is very interesting question. <clears throat> um, I think uh, both sides uh, wish to elevate <clears throat> our relationship to a new height in the near future. But if you look at the relationship right now, you will see that we have many areas of strategic cooperation already. First and foremost, I think uh, we have been working very closely to maintain peace, stability, security, and cooperation in the whole Asia Pacific region. That's very important. Now, uh, we also have the South China Sea or the East Sea issue. We want to maintain those principles, very important, uh, respect international laws, including UNCLOS 1982, freedom of navigation, etc. Now, sub Mekong region, also of strategic significance, and most recently, climate change and pandemic fighting the COVID-19 and for economic recovery. So we already have the strategic substance in our bilateral cooperation. I think the only thing we need to do is to change the name. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was uh, a very succinct answer. So maybe we do have time for one more. Um, we had a question from uh, Mara Lee about another issue that cropped up over the last couple of years. And that was the question of the USDR and Treasury's findings on Vietnam allegedly manipulating currency um, and damaging US companies. I'm just curious if you have, have an update how Vietnam sees this issue now under the new administration and whether or not you're confident that's been put in the rear view mirror. Are there actions that Vietnam can take to reassure the US that this won't be a problem in the future? Thank you. Uh, that's, that's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> you know that the, um, the Trump administration put Vietnam in the list of uh, currency manipulation. But we welcome uh, the most recent development, new development by the Biden administration to uh, outlist Vietnam, to put Vietnam out of that list. So we are no longer in the list of money manipulators, but we know that we still have some issues uh, to work together. And uh, since the very beginning of the, this administration, the Vietnamese side has been working very closely with the Treasury Department with USTR. We provided information they need. And I think the State Bank of Vietnam also have some adjustment in their money policy. But I want to assure you that Vietnam uh, monetary policy is not to gain the advantage in trade with the United States. The main purpose is to 
keep the macro economy stable and check inflation. So I think with the spirit of partnership and cooperation, the two sides can work together on this issue. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I, I think I speak for everybody. Unfortunately, we can't have a raucous round of applause, but, but I imagine there would be one. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak Thank to us you. this morning. Uh, we will now move into our uh, public panel where we're going to have three speakers follow up on, on this uh, the basket of issues on, on the US-Vietnam uh, economic partnership. So with that, please everybody virtually join me in thanking uh, Ambassador Nyok for his time. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Now allow me to introduce our panel. We're going to have three excellent speakers um, and, and going in nothing but alphabetical order, we will begin with uh, Ambassador Ted Osius. Ted was uh, formerly the US ambassador to Vietnam and is now vice president for government affairs uh, and public policy in Google's Asia Pacific shop uh, based in Singapore. Then we'll hear from Mary Tanuka, who is the executive director of AmCham Vietnam based in Ho Chi Minh City. And finally, uh, Professor Wen Chuan Tang, with, uh, who's the lecturer of public policy at Fallbright University in Vietnam, where he and Ted work together. Um, and with that, uh, let me turn the floor over to Ted, please. Thank you, Greg. Uh, it's, it's great to be with you. Uh, it was great to hear my friend, Ambassador Ha Kim Lop speak so eloquently and uh, so confidently and optimistically about the future of the relationship. I'm uh, also really happy to share this panel with my good friend, uh, Mary Tarnufka, and my good friend, Nguyen Swan Tang. Um, and thanks to Samsung for, for uh, sponsoring this event. Uh, it's really great to be part of it. So I will touch on three aspects of the US-Vietnam economic relation uh, partnership. Uh, first, why has Vietnam vaulted onto the short list of countries of greatest interest to American investors. Uh, second, why smart handling of the pandemic means that prospects for the partnership continue to be good. And third, I'm gonna raise, because I work for Google, I'm gonna raise some specific questions uh, regarding the tech industry and digital transformation in Vietnam. So first, uh, quickly, the story of growth. Um, Vietnam's development over the past 30 years has been uh, miraculous. Uh, since 1986 and the economic reforms that were launched under Doi Moi, there has been very rapid economic growth transforming what was once one of the world's poorest nations into a, a lower middle income country. And just a few statistics, in 1989, Vietnam's GDP was less than $100 per capita. By 2019, that per capita GDP exceeded $2,700. Uh, during that time, more than 45 million people were lifted out of poverty, and poverty rates declined sharply from something like 60 or 70 percent to below 6 percent. And the, a big turning point was uh, in 2006 when investors decided Vietnam was the new China, and FDI rose rapidly, especially in the banking and real estate sectors. And then uh, the financial crisis came in 2008. It didn't affect Vietnam too much. Uh, capital was looking for return and Vietnam was attractive. And since 2008, export values have climbed really rapidly. 70% uh, of those uh, of the export value coming from Vietnam is uh, produced by firms where there's foreign direct investment. Uh, in, uh, Ambassador Ngoc mentioned this, in 2018, there was uh, a movement, there were tensions in the in, uh, US-China uh, trade arena and uh, Vietnam was seen as a, an attractive alternative. So FDI shot up again. For example, uh, solar panels made by Chinese companies were shifted, production was shifted to Vietnam because the tariff structure uh, was more attractive. And a lot of that, uh, that activity is likely to continue, um, but uh, there's also a challenge. And I'm gonna plant the seed for a challenge I'll come back to. A lot of the FDI was based on the premise of low cost labor. And that's a, that's a problem that I'll come back to in a moment. Part two is uh, the story of COVID. And if you look back just a little over a year ago, uh, to January, 2020, the United States and Vietnam both recorded their first COVID cases in late January. 
But even with an 870 mile porous border with China and a population of nearly 100 million, during the past 15 months, Vietnam managed to keep its total number of COVID cases to less than 3,000 with only 35 deaths. The IMF said uh, Vietnam was, showing, was creating a roadmap for other developing countries. By contrast, the United States in the same time period suffered more than 32 million infections and more than 570,000 deaths, nearly 10 times the number of American lives lost in the Vietnam War. Now, this the strategy was pretty simple. And it, if you look at a really specific time period, it was March 20th to April 21st last year, and the strategy was wash hands, wear masks, and stay at home. And leaders such as Deputy Prime Minister Vu Duc Dam framed the pandemic as an enemy. And they issued public service announcements saying, the virus is threatening the human race. We've entered a war. Everyone is now a soldier. And Vietnam mobilized a small army of doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals. Even artists were mobilized in this task. And if any country can win a war against a powerful enemy, it is Vietnam. But of course, Vietnam was, has been affected uh, given its very deep integration with the global economy. Uh, Vietnam has a, a trade to GDP ratio of 200%, sixth highest in the world. The Vietnamese economy was hit by the pandemic, but it's shown remarkable resilience and the GDP uh, in, of Vietnam grew 2.9% in 2020. It was one of only a few countries to have economic growth last year. But the crisis left an a, a lasting impact on households with 45% of households reporting a lower income this January than January a year ago. And the effects of COVID include uh, over 30 million people unemployed or living on reduced income. And among the 5 million who are really unemployed, uh, 1.2 million lost their jobs in manufacturing, 1.1 million in retail, and nearly a million in hotels and catering. Uh, but uh, on, the, on the premise of a, of a quick recovery this year, Vietnam's economy could grow over 6% uh, if, because it's, it's dealt with COVID so well. Um, and because there's still strong performance among uh, export oriented manufacturers and robust recovery in domestic demand. I think that by handling COVID so well, uh, Vietnam's leadership is riding, riding a, a wave of approval and the state and the party are seen as more open and approachable and the business window remains opening. And that makes me, that leads me to the digital revolution, which is accelerating. And it's something that Vietnam wants to take advantage of. Uh, the government has made uh, a real effort to go online during COVID, including via online learning, uh, including an effort to broadcast government events on social media, including telemedicine, e-public services, and there's been an effort to encourage businesses to go online. And this is sending uh, strong positive signals to investors about digital transformation. So let me talk just for a moment about digital transformation. Uh, Vietnam is facing rapid demographic and social change. Its population is expected to reach 120 million by 2050. It has a fast growing middle class currently accounting for 13% of the population, but that's expected to reach 26% by 2026 with a GDP of as much as $10,000 per capita on average. Now to deal with the demands of a growing middle class, Vietnamese leaders need to deliver fast economic growth over the next decade to keep pace with the, the, the changes and to ensure quality jobs for a young, better educated population. And to do that, there's a need to upgrade, upgrade the skills of the workforce to create productive jobs on a larger scale in the future. And also to bridge the divide between urban and rural Vietnam through, more, uh, through programs that are more inclusive in how they build uh, digital skills. Now, I mentioned earlier that a lot of the foreign direct, direct investment that's flown into the, flowed into Vietnam was premised on low cost labor. But rather than get stuck in a trap where Vietnam continues to manufacture low value added goods 
the country has a strategy to move up the value chain. And a big part of that is adoption and implementation of an effective digital economy strategy. The idea is move up the manufacturing value chain, increase investments in its service industry and use Industrial Revolution 4.0, make it a priority and use it to build the digital part of the economy so that it represents 30% of GDP by 2030. And on, on uh, Digital 4.0, uh, the previous prime minister issued a directive that aimed at strengthening the ability to, uh, to do, do two things. One was build high quality human resources uh, so that these, these challenges can be addressed by the Vietnamese population, which as the ambassador said, is full of young, talented, ambitious, uh, and hyper energetic people. And then also to improve, improve the digital awareness of government officials. And there's already been a lot of progress. There are, Vietnam has more than 56 million smartphones representing more than 80% uh, of the population of people over 15. Access to data is cheap. 5G will roll out soon. And there's widespread access to free Wi-Fi. There is already in Vietnam a $5 billion uh, software development industry. Nearly 400,000 developers are, are a part of that, accounting for 57% 50, of those who are employed in the IT industry. There's a lot of talent that's centered in Ho Chi Minh City where Mary and Swan Tang are, and the ambassador spoke about the, the dynamism of that workforce. Uh, in Vietnam, because there's so much energy in the SME sector, SMEs are likely to develop their own digital strategies and they represent as much as 80% of the country's employment. Now, where, where are the hitches? Uh, the government could, may want to uh, consider policies that support app and game development as it's clear Vietnam has great potential to excel in this area and it's a money-making area, I can tell you. Um, and given the, the party's twin goals of economic growth, which require investment and of efficient, effectively managing the state, which is seen to require control, there will be key challenges that will face the new leadership involving how to work around existing laws, like the law on cybersecurity, in order to continue to facilitate uh, foreign direct investment in Vietnam. Vietnam's approach to lawmaking isn't always coherent. We see a lot of overlapping rules and regulations we see different agencies within the government wanting to lead on issues such as cybersecurity and content control. And we see challenges in, in the area of data localization, which straddles both of these categories. Now, some of the draft legislation poses a challenge to investors like Google. Uh, it, it creates operating uncertainty for tech companies that want to invest more in Vietnam. And these draft laws uh, come in different flavors. They, they range from an implementing decree on cybersecurity, uh, decrees on content regulation, broadcasting regulations, digital advertising, and taxes. So this is a, a task to be addressed by the, the new government. Uh, the, the goal, I think, of these new, these new rules and regulations is to support the growth of Vietnamese tech companies and control content. That's okay, but that won't get Vietnam where it wants to go in terms of, of really, uh, really considerable uh, digital economy strategy that will grow the economy the way the, the uh, government's aspirations line up. So uh, thanks very much for, letting, for listening to me. I look forward to questions. I look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you, Ted. Uh, and now I'll turn over the camera to Mary Tarnuska. Mary? Thank you. And it is my honor to join this panel as well with Ambassador Hakim Nyok and former Ambassador Ted Osius and Professor Nguyen Sun Tan, who I see more frequently, as I'm also a close friend and partner of Fulbright University. Um, when I heard Ambassador Nyok speak, it reminded me of my farewell call with Ambassador Nyok when I was uh, Consul General 
and I shared with him that I was going to be taking this new position. And we talked at that point about the trade imbalance and what steps Vietnam could take to address that imbalance, increasing its imports of energy, of agriculture, of aircraft, aviation infrastructure equipment, maybe even defense articles. Because there was at that time, I would say a fixation, perhaps a fascination with the bilateral trade in goods balance. I think, you know, the current administration is not quite as fixated on this, but I think it is important that for the sake of the relationship, we continue to look for ways to address that and try and bring it into closer balance. In my role at AmCham, it's been very interesting. AmCham actually predates diplomatic relations with between the United States and Vietnam. AmCham was established both here in Ho Chi Minh City and in Hanoi informally um, after the trade embargo was lifted, but before diplomatic relations were established about 26 years ago. So we're now, I'm based in Ho Chi Minh City. We have branches in Hanoi and one we just established last year in Da Nang. And our membership continues to grow because US businesses are very bullish about the opportunities here in Vietnam. Ambassador Nyo and former Ambassador Osius noted a number of those opportunities. I think particularly as companies are seeking to diversify supply chains, increase that resiliency and connectivity, this was already happening for years as labor costs went up in China. The trade tensions between the US and China increased that trend. And I think the COVID disruptions increased it further. But Vietnam is seen as being incredibly attractive for um, manufacturing supply chains. It's very strategic geographic location, the political stability, the welcome of FDI. As Ambassador Njok mentioned, the integrated network of free trade agreements, the young tech savvy workforce, the entrepreneurial kind of mindset, I'd say particularly in Ho Chi Minh City in the South. And Vietnam is also one of the fastest growing economies in the world with a large and growing consumer market. And there's two other factors there. Um, as Ambassador Osius mentioned, the COVID response of Vietnam is, has been an incredible boost. We hear from many of our manufacturing investors here in Vietnam that Vietnam was the only place in the world where they were able to continue their operations 24 seven. Intel for solar have shared that. And I think that has also you know, contributed a lot towards the investment climate here. Another factor which was surprising to me when I came and I think which continues is despite the complex history between the United States and Vietnam, there is an incredibly positive view in Vietnam of the United States and of US products for quality and safety. So I think that's another advantage for US companies that are considering investing here in Vietnam. In terms of the challenges, I think one of the challenges, you know, it continues to be managing these 301 investigations, continuing to reduce administrative, um, well, to continuing to carry out administrative reforms to reduce barriers to trade and investment, as Ambassador Osius noted, ensuring that there's a regulatory environment for the digital economy that is free, that promotes a free, open and secure digital economy. That's gonna be the key for Vietnam to ensure that it continues to be an attractive place for innovation, for entrepreneurship and for reaching those goals of industrial revolution 4.0. As AmCham, we also see we need to have the United States have a free trade agreement with Vietnam. So I would say we had a recent uh, meeting between, was about 80 members of AmCham from throughout the country with former Ambassador Crittenbrink and members of the US mission team. Ambassador Osius will remember these AmCham weekends. 
Um, but we had several breakout groups focused on different areas of concern. And the key one, which attracted the most attendees, was strengthening the trade and investment framework and laying the groundwork for an eventual FTA. We think it's critical that the United States and Vietnam have an FTA. We understand this is not a top priority for the Biden administration, that they have shared that they're going to be focused on American workers. But we think it's very important to demonstrate that trade is important and really beneficial to Amer American workers and American farmers. Among other things, Vietnam is the sixth largest destination for US agricultural exports in the world. A free trade agreement would make that much more competitive. US companies are losing competition and are increasingly on the margins as Vietnam enters into free trade agreements, whether CPTPP or now um, the Europe-Vietnam FTA. So that's our top priority. I think another key area of concern, it's a challenge and an opportunity, is enabling a safe reopening. Vietnam has done an impressive job in managing the COVID pandemic through contact tracing, through quarantining, through testing. I mean, it's incredible. And we have these freedoms here in Vietnam that are just, I mean, I feel like it's really, inappropriate for me sometimes to post on Facebook or Instagram because we are able to have large gatherings. We have freedoms that are really unknown elsewhere in the world. But Vietnam runs the risk of falling behind if it is unable to enable that safe reopening. It's going to take more vaccines in country, getting that distribution rolled out. And then it's going to be facilitating travel of business travelers, of residents here, and hopefully also, you know, eventually of tourists, particularly those who have been vaccinated and looking to reduce and perhaps eventually as the science becomes more clear, eliminate quarantines for those who have been vaccinated. So that enabling a safe reopening, I think will be critical for maintaining the growth. Another factor we saw is really building infrastructure for sustainable growth. Again, this is both a challenge and an opportunity and US companies really want to contribute, whether this is energy, aviation infrastructure, and also new agricultural technologies to help address issues in the Mekong region. We also want to help partner to build local supply chains. One of the things that I think was a wake up call for many companies who thought they had diversified their supply chains was during COVID realizing so much was still dependent on China. So that's something we're really looking actively to partner with the Vietnamese government and local SMEs to help build that integration into Vietnamese and global supply chains. And finally, I would say it's really working together to develop a globally competitive workforce. As I mentioned, it's one of the strengths of Vietnam that they have a very young tech savvy workforce, but often many of the college graduates really don't there's a skills gap. Sometimes it's English, sometimes it's critical thinking skills, the soft skills, as they say, ability to work in teams, to speak up. And it's the hands-on problem solving ability rather than test taking ability. So that's another area where we're working with many of our members in the education field, organizations like Fulbright University, Arizona State and others to address that skills gaps. But I really see incredible opportunities here in Vietnam. There's a reason why I decided to step down from my diplomatic career and stay here. I mean, I personally and AmCham Vietnam is really invested in the future and we see incredible opportunities here. So that's it for me. Thank you, Mary. And our closer, uh, Wen Chuan Tang. Thank you, uh, Greg. So, um, we enter the year 2021 with a new government in place in the US and also a new government in place uh, in Vietnam. So in my brief remarks, I will cover uh, 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 the, the new policy direction under uh, these uh, new governments. So one is, I think everybody in Vietnam, I mean, agree, I mean, I absolutely high level of consensus is 
whatever the world will look like, Vietnam will continue to pursue deeper economic integration and keep the economy open. So this time last year, there was a lot of nervousness in Vietnam uh, because of uh, the impact of COVID and because the uh, degree of openness of the economy, Ambassador Tedosi has mentioned, uh, Vietnam is now one of the most open economies in the world in terms of uh, trade. But actually, it turned out that the trade openness saved the economy uh, last year. So because COVID was well under control, uh, Vietnam was able to keep all export-oriented manufacturing facilities running uninterrupted. So why locally uh, domestic sales services all went down? Manufacturing exports went up by 7%. And that's what kept uh, the economy growing last year at 2.9%. Uh, and that helped with the most recent party Congress that even with trouble in the global economy and in the world, uh, actually, we need to be open economically. So, so that's uh, the new government in place, and that's also a very clear message. And in that economic integration strategy, the U.S. is very important. So I, I mentioned, I mean, 7% growth in export last year for Vietnam, and actually that was because mostly of export to the U.S., and in the first three months this year, I just look at the data, export from Vietnam to the US ended up by even 29%. So, so I, I think, so, so here, Ambassador Hakim also mentioned, Vietnam is very keen into, I mean, having either an FTA with the US or for the US to rejoin CPTPP. Uh, because of, of all the F major strategic FTAs that Vietnam secured uh, with the EU, with all of the largest trading partners in Asia, the US is the only one that Vietnam still uh, hasn't had. So, so, but at the same time, there's also nervousness about also the Biden administration having trade not at the top of priority. Right? President Biden mentioned that he will consider joint. Uh, joining C CPTPP, but with a renegotiation. So for Vietnam and many other countries like Japan, Australia, renegotiation will take a lot of time, especially when you reopen up all of the previous issues relating to uh, intellectual property rights and also labor issues. Uh, the, an, uh, a bilateral FTA between the US and Vietnam is also very challenging. If the Biden administration put in new demands uh, for higher standards in terms of labor and, and other uh, non-trade uh, trading issues. So that's uh, so why the Vietnamese government is very keen in either having the US rejoice CPTPP or having a um, FTA. But I, I think the, the ball is actually on the US uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to pursue that. So that's economic openness. The second one under the two new administrations is energy and infrastructure. So, so for Vietnam, it's also very positive that, that the Biden administration is moving very uh, actively back into sustainable development, uh, 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 climate change is issues, and renewable uh, energy. And on the Vietnamese side also, uh, what the Communist Party is realizing that there's increasingly public pressure on climate change adaptation and pursuing sustainable energy uh, strategies. Right? So what is waiting on the desk of the new Prime Minister of Vietnam is the 2021-2030 electricity development plan. So unless that plan is approved, I think it will be very difficult to pursue whether new large scale solar and wind power projects plus LNG gas power plants. So all of them are actually written down in the draft electricity plan. 
So the good news, uh, the good news is that the new prime minister of Vietnam is seen as the infrastructure person. He made his name when uh, he was a provincial party chief uh, in a northern province of Vietnam who actually embarked on a very uh, ag aggressive infrastructure and energy development plan. And uh, the expectation is that he will be more decisive in approving this electricity development plan and other energy uh, initiatives. So, so, th so the positive development is as you, you have the Biden administration moving back into sustainable uh, energy and also the Vietnamese government will be more willing, I mean, both under the new leadership, but also with increasing social pressure that, that you will see uh, 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 the more sustainable and then renewable energy project put in the electricity development uh, plan. And, and that will make uh, actually uh, the uh, a lot of, I mean, like still on paper, but uh, the LNG infrastructures and also solar and wind power projects, I think, become a reality. Uh, uh, finally, I think also in his uh, acceptance speech as uh, Prime Minister of Vietnam, uh, uh, Mr. Phạm Minh Ching also mentioned that, that his government uh, will uh, make more uh, aggressive mode, uh, move for digital trans transformation. Uh, uh, I think Ambassador Ted Osius uh, mentioned that, but I think uh, the reality is that uh, what the Vietnamese government wants is to try to be pragmatic with this new digital transformation strategy. On the one hand, he, the government knows that uh, uh, with the Communist Party still on top, they cannot have, I mean, let go of the government control uh, uh, of, of the digital transformation. So the cyber security law will be there to stay. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they are trying to find a way to be pragmatic in terms of that for purely business transactions. Uh, they will adopt a kind of more liberal uh, legal framework. So it's more like they, they learn from other Asian countries, South Korea, Singapore, especially, right? So the party state will still firmly control the society and uh, as much as possible, but allowing businesses to pursue and 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 try to build an ecosystem so that startups in fintech, in uh, other technology, because they realize that unlike China, the Communist Party in Vietnam will be unable to close down social media. Vietnamese are already connected uh, worldwide. And also at the same time, the Vietnamese government will be unable to build their own technology platform for Vietnamese. So Vietnam will have to continue to have access to Western technology, in particular the, uh, the US. So I, my, my guess is that what we see in the coming year is a new roadmap for digital transformation in which they will allow a more liberal regulatory framework for purely they consider business uh, investments that have no, what they call, Public security uh, concern, but for on the other side, they try to separate the issues. But in terms of public security, still very firm uh, control. So economic openness, uh, energy, and technology. That's uh, uh, my uh, ten-minute remark. Thank you. Thank you, Sean Tang. So uh, I am uh, happy to report that just in time for Q and A, my neighbor has finally finished mowing his lawn, so I don't have to be quite so afraid about unmuting myself. Uh, if you have questions for the panel, specific panelists or the panel in general, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A, um, and we'd appreciate it if you could identify yourself when you do so. Let me start with uh, a pretty good general question that comes from Roxanne Wen. What are the advantages and disadvantages of Vietnam compared to other neighbors in Southeast Asia as a destination for U.S. investment? 
I think that's a good one maybe to just go around the horn. Um, Mary, did, would you like to, to start? Sure. Um, so there was a recent survey that was conducted among different AMCHAMs in the ASEAN region, which was looking at what is the top destination for investment in the Asia Pacific region. And Vietnam came out tops. I mean, I think it's many of the issues that I noted when you differentiate Vietnam from its neighbors, that integration into the trade networks and a very stable political system, which is very opening, very open to FDI. I think that really helps differentiate it. I think the COVID year really differentiated Vietnam. The effectiveness of Vietnam's response was amazing. And as Ambassador Osius noted, it was not just the contact tracing, the quarantining, the testing. It was, a very, it was an overall approach of the government employing creative means using um, TikTok stars and rappers and kind of the old propaganda art, but in a new way to really get the message together and get the Vietnamese community together on this. And there was, I think, a very new transparency, which was taking place as well, which really built the confidence of the people. So I think there's an incredible patriotism here and kind of communal response. But Vietnam is very welcoming to foreign investment, very dynamic economy, young workforce. There's a lot going for it. The issues that I mentioned as challenges are really also opportunities. The fact that Vietnam has some energy shortfalls. US firms are really eager to partner to build the, the energy, whether it's LNG or renewables. Similarly on infrastructure, I think US companies are really eager to help address that, whether it's aviation or port infrastructure. So I think there's a lot of pluses there. Now, the challenge I think you know, for Vietnam, it's the infrastructure compares nothing to a China. One of our board members who's in the port business will say a 5% decrease in container traffic to Shanghai is about a 70% increase here in Vietnam. There's no way that you can just shift that. Similarly on supply chains, Vietnam does not have that whole network of OEM suppliers that exist in a place like China. That's something they're having to continue to build. But I think compared to other alternatives in the region, Vietnam has a lot of pluses, which is why I think we continue to see both our existing companies here, investors expand their operations and continue to attract a lot of new investors. Hey, Barry. Ted, did you want to weigh in on that one? Uh, briefly, I think Mary nailed it. Um, I, I agree with very much with, with her characterization of the advantages that Vietnam has to offer for investors. Um, I would note one, in addition to the, the infrastructure challenges, another challenge is still that there are sometimes confusing and overlapping regulations and that scares off uh, some investors. But I think Swan Tang's right. The government tends to be pretty pragmatic uh, about how it enforces and deals with a lot of those regulations. I believe that Swan Tang is also right that that will be true in the IT space, that there will be a, a pragmatic a approach to uh, enforcing the cybersecurity law, for example. Um, because if you want to keep attracting investment, you also have to have an, uh, an environment where innovation can flourish. Uh, and Mary touched on that at, at the end of her earlier remarks, this need to, to build up the skills of, the Viet, of uh, these young, industrious, hardworking people who need to have the whole panoply of skills in order to, to work for some of the companies that are coming in. And there, uh, Fulbright University and ASU and uh, other American institutions are playing a really important role. And I think uh, there's reason to be really uh, proud of that intersection. 
Thanks, Ted. Uh, Sean Tong, I, I'd welcome your thoughts on that in general, but I also want to give you the specific question that came in from Kyle Springer at the First US Asia Center, who I should say, Kyle, like Ted, is a proud alumnus of the Southeast Asia program at CSIS. Uh, so Kyle said, Vietnam has completed its first LNG import terminal in Bara, Vung Tau province, and could begin receiving shipments this year. What tools will the US and Vietnam deploy to advance Vietnam's natural gas import infrastructure and the US-Vietnam energy partnership? Okay, so, so I think even with the infrastructure, right, the LNG terminal in place, this, I think, it's not clear from the government yet. I mean, about the gas power plants, the new gas power plants, how many will there be, uh, right? So, so my, uh, that's why uh, in, in my remark, I mentioned that uh, the government of Vietnam needs to approve the new electricity development plan and to make clear a priority. So in the past plan, it usually is for everything. So coal power plants still there. So it's just like you want everything. And in the last five years, very little new capacity uh, got built. So the, 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 the pressure now on the government is to make clear priorities. Renewable plus LNG. That means also higher cost because LNG is expensive. That means they need to be able to raise electricity tariff domestically, right? So, so I, I think, I think uh, to make the whole, I think uh, all the investment plans, you, you have the terminal in Barria, uh, Vung Tau, and M Ambassador Hakim Ngoc mentioned also, you have American investments uh, getting approval in principle for terminals in the south central coast uh, of Vietnam. But to make all of those projects financially feasible and sustainable, first, locally, they need to raise electricity tariff. And then the electricity plan, clear, right? Get rid of coal. Focus on renewable and gas power plant. Unless it's approved by the government, I don't think uh, these new terminals will uh, well, we'll, we'll get uh, uh, going. Thank you, Sean Tong. Let me um, shift gears with a question from Lin Dong Wen for uh, Ted. So Ted, uh, Lin Dong asked, uh, it, with VOA, I apologize, uh, says you oppose the deportation of Vietnam war era refugees under the Trump administration. It's been reported that a new agreement was negotiated by the previous administration um, signed by President Biden and that uh, ICE deported a plane full of Vietnamese immigrants from Texas last March. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, I don't know about, I'm not in government anymore, so I don't know uh, what has happened in terms of the numbers of people being deported since I left government. So if there was a flight that left Texas and went to Hanoi, I don't know. Um, what I do know is that, you know, no matter who does it, uh, these, these deportations, I think, are wrong. Um, I, I'm on record as having differed with the Trump administration on, on this. Uh, I may be a proud Democrat, but I also would differ with the Biden administration. These are folks who, who uh, in many cases, uh, fought alongside Americans in the war. Uh, in other cases, were the children of American service people. Um, I don't think that uh, that these I don't think I don't think these deportations are part of a coherent policy. Uh, I think they got they got started uh, as part of a, a, a policy of the, the previous administration that I think was frankly racist. Um, so I don't I don't think they should be pursued. Uh, I, and you know uh, I think the the uh, ma many judges have agreed with. The assessment that that I made, and I've continued to to file depositions um, because I, I continue to think that uh, these are these deportations are wrong. I think this should be argued in the, in the political space and and not take place behind closed doors. Thank you, Ted. 
Uh, we have uh, a couple questions from Joe Wadzikowski from uh, Johns Hopkins site. So let me pick one that I think is interesting for maybe the entire panel. Joe said, which of these do you think is most likely to occur under the Biden administration? So we have a, a choose your own adventure. Uh, first, the United States rejoining CPTPP. Second, the United States joining ARSA. That's an interesting one. Third, the US and Vietnam signing the bilateral FTA. Fourth, no change. Or fifth, economic sanctions over currency manipulation. Mary, did, would you like to, to jump in first? Do you see any of those, some combination of those as, as feasible under the administration? I would think that the most likely are that there's no real change, that we continue working with the trade and investment framework agreement and we bring our list of complaints and they bring their list of complaints or CPTPP. I think there's much more to be gained from both sides by entering into CPTPP than a bilateral free trade agreement. I don't see the particular advantage of the US entering into RCEP. And I think both sides are really trying to manage the situation so that we are not likely to end up with a sanction situation. So hope for CPTPP, really hope we don't stay in this status quo forever, because I think we are continuing as the United States both to lose economic competitiveness, but also to lose strategic influence. And you know, I hope that both of those justifications will give us the motivation to do the right thing. Sean Tang, from Vietnam's perspective, I mean, which, which, which is Hanoi rooting for most, do you think? I think Hanoi won't want the US re-entering CPTPP, right? So uh, Hanoi doesn't, I mean, I mean, it's preferred option to having uh, negoti to negotiate a better F uh, FTA. Uh, a lot of pressure, right? So it's one-on-one -on -one negotiation with the US. It's not something uh, uh, easy uh, uh, for, uh, for Vietnam. And my view is that uh, with China taking a lead role in ASEAN, EP, that will put pressure on the Biden administration to think about rejoining CPTPP around midterm, right? So I, I think China will be moving very fast uh, with India out of the picture, right? So a lot of ASEAN countries are also happy uh, to have uh, 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 ch uh, China because already China is their biggest trading partners. So for Vietnam, I think Vietnam doesn't want that. <laughs> so they, they would hope that the, the US will see that. I mean, you cannot have China taking the lead with uh, the trade initiatives in the region. Can I jump in with a sixth option, Greg? Please do. Um, I, 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 uh, I, I certainly don't think that there are gonna be sanctions. I think there's, there's uh, there's strategic reasons to strengthen the economic relationship and the administration will seize that. One way of doing it that would be kind of low hanging fruit is to discuss a digital free trade agreement. Um, there are already really good models out there. Singapore has a digital trade agreement with Australia and another one with New Zealand and Chile. And of course, you'll remember that TPP started with Singapore and a small group of other countries and then grew. Well, the CPP, CPTPP has one of the best uh, digital trade chapters around. There's also one in the uh, US-Japan free trade agreement. So there are a bunch of really good models out there and, and, and Vietnam's ambitious when it comes to uh, growing its IT sector. So this would seem to me at least possible or it might be uh, might be a kind of a coalition of countries. Uh, it might be a, a direct negotiation, but it seems to me that would be less hard than yanking the United States back into, uh, into TPP or into CPTPP. Thanks, Dad. Let, let me stay with you for this question from Scott Thompson. Uh, would you agree that Vietnam moving up the value chain doesn't mean leaving manufacturing behind, 
but rather includes digitizing and otherwise upgrading the forms of manufacturing with the assistance of FDI. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I mean, our own experience, we like Samsung and Apple, Google manufactures IT hardware in Vietnam. We use contract manufacturers for this. It's, not a, it's no secret. Um, uh, and what we want to do is have that those activities grow so that there's there are it's not just putting the 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 uh, devices together but over time that a, a whole ecosystem grows around that kind of manufacturing where uh, innovation occurs and products are not only manufactured in Vietnam but invented created in Vietnam so um, I, I, I agree with the premise of the question. I think there, there's a lot of value added that can grow out of manufacturing that may start out fairly low tech, but quickly can become uh, much more high tech. Because one of the things you do when you have, when you have, when you have a manufacturing operation such as we have, is you're, you need to train up engineers. You need to grow the stable of, of engineers who can manage an operation like that. So you have a, a natural process of upskilling that occurs anytime um, uh, a, a tech company uh, engages in manufacturing. And I think that would be the case for, for uh, other companies like Samsung and Apple and others as well. Thanks, Ted. Uh, we have a question. Well, we have a two-part question from Murray Hebert, um, who's also with the South Asia program here. And, and Ted uh, already alluded to part of it, which was whether or not Vietnam would support a digital trade agreement with the US given the inability, presumed inability, at least early on, the Biden administration to do something more comprehensive. So I wonder, Sean Tong, do you think that that would be of interest to Hanoi? And could I also ask you Murray's other question, which was, do you expect any major economic policy changes following the party Congress and the new leadership? Yeah, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in previous uh, uh, political cycles, I think all uh, the leaders of the Vietnamese government all managed to have secured some kind of major trade deals. Uh, so, so for the new government, I think they will be keen to pursue an opportunity for an important uh, one. I mean, whether it's also a, a digital one. So it's also key because uh, Prime Minister Phạm Minh Chính also mentioned that he he wants to promote uh, digital uh, transformation. So so I think it's it's very uh, it's very feasible. Um, I think um, also the um, for me it's it's the change in economic policy. I think also for Vietnam is uh, in terms of digital transformation. Uh, it, I think it will be different uh, from low cost manufacturing, which is very export oriented, right? Major investments in digital transformation for Vietnam will also gear up to take advantage of the enlarging domestic market. So Vietnam is actually witnessing rapid urbanization uh, in greater Hanoi area and greater Ho Chi Minh City uh, area. And I think the a lot of growth is coming from the emerging middle class. And that's where a lot of digital transformation happen with digital banking, fintech, uh, e-commerce. So they're all geared up to the, the, uh, the large domestic market. So I, I, think, uh, I think one major policy, um, I think it's also a challenge for the new government is how to handle rapid urbanization and using the smart city concept and digital transformation to, uh, to help with that, uh, uh, with that. And another area is also infrastructure development. Uh, uh, Mary mentioned uh, logistics and uh, airport, uh, North-South expressways. Those are the, the thing that previous governments were unable uh, to accomplish and but at least for now they clear up the regulatory huddles so the new government will have little excuse if they can uh, they uh, uh, they cannot carry out major infrastructure projects in the next five, five years mary did you want to weigh in on this one too i think they've covered it 
<laughs> okay. Um, we have a, a question, another question from uh, Victron, uh, which uh, I feel like has to be addressed. Um, and, and I guess I will start maybe with Mary then, since you, you begged off that one. Do you have any thoughts on the challenges posed by Vietnam's cybersecurity law and how it can be addressed to further develop the country's tech growth? So I think the cybersecurity law is a big overhang on the investment environment here. It's something that the implementing decrees have been drafted and withdrawn, I think at least a few times in the last couple of years. And the concern is something that doesn't just affect the tech companies like the Googles, the Facebooks, it really affects companies writ large here, who one of the big um, attributes that's beneficial in Vietnam is the fact that people are so tech savvy and connected. I think more than two thirds of the Vietnamese population are active users of Facebook. And it's that kind of online collaboration which gives rise to a lot of the innovation and entrepreneurship here and the creativity. So I think there's serious concern both among Vietnamese and among investors. And I know when I was Consul General, it was one of the things where young Vietnamese would come and tell me kind of off the beaten path events that the US standing up for the freedom of association and freedom of expression, I should say, and having you know the ability of people to express their views peacefully was super important. And they were very concerned if a cybersecurity law looked like it was going to create a kind of online environment here like China. I think it's a real strength. Vietnam does not have that now. And I think these were some of the concerns with previous iterations of implementing decrees. So I think I'm hopeful as um, Ambassador Osius is and as Professor Nguyen Soon Tan, that the government will continue to be pragmatic in this regard. I think they realize they need to strike that balance. So, you know, we're very hopeful. It is, it is this sort of looming threat there because these implementing regulations could be issued at any time and they really do color the overall investment environment. Thanks Mary. We have uh, three minutes and a whole lot more than, uh, a whole lot more than three questions. So obviously we're, we're not gonna get through all of them. So I think I'd actually like to close on a bit of a softball or a positive note. One that I know speaks to Ted's um, long held preferences uh, as, as ambassador. So we had Michael Anderson with the Public Diplomacy Council ask if you could recommend one specific public diplomacy idea or initiative to advance the bilateral relationship uh, under the Biden administration, what would it be? Uh, so hello, Mike, wherever you are. Um, you know, I think every, every government's worried about recovering from COVID right now. And I mentioned earlier more than uh, you know, almost a million people lost their jobs in the hospitality industry. And Ambassador Ngoc mentioned that in 2019, there have been 800,000 visitors from the United States. Well, the doors will open again. I don't know, you know, we don't know exactly when, uh, but they will open again. So I would design something around, um, what, and we've been doing, we've been doing uh, some digital Tour, enabling digital tourism opportunities to whet the appetites of people to come to come back to Vietnam. But I would design something around uh, tourism because that industry needs to get back up and going again. And because the country has handled COVID so well, I think it will. And if I could have one more minute, um, my book is coming out in October. I got to mention that because Ambassador Ngoc talked about the grand idea of the, our two countries working more closely together on regional and global challenges, and he listed them. And I talk about the origin of that idea and many other things um, in uh, this book, Nothing is Impossible, America's Reconciliation with Vietnam, which is about the 25 year arc of our reconciliation. It'll be out uh, in English in October and in uh, Vietnamese in 2022. Thanks, Ted. 
So that serves as my reminder that I uh, made Ted promise late last year that when the book came out, he would do a launch at CSIS. So now love everybody, to. everybody saw it. He, he's agreed um, by virtue of being to. here today. <laughs> let me uh, let me pull the plug there. We're right at 1030, which is always a good and rare thing with a, a DC based event. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. And particularly, thank you to Ted and Mary and Shantang for taking their time and to Ambassador Nyan for for the keynote today. I hope that everybody uh, will be able to join us again on Thursday when we'll have the second uh, of these two-part conferences on the political security relationship. And that'll start with a, uh, a keynote by Edgar Kagan, uh, the Senior Director for East Asia uh, and Oceania at the National Security Council. And then we'll have a panel discussion with Wen Tuan Viet at Diplomat Academy of Vietnam, Murray Hebert uh, from CSIS and Victron with Antwerp University. And so with that, Thank you all very much and have a wonderful day or a wonderful night uh, for all three of our panelists.